And so with that, I'd love to, to reintroduce, you've met them already informally, um, Duncan uh, Ross from Times Higher Education, Emily Gresham from FIU, and Cam Donaldson. Um, we're going to take a, a few minutes to kind of explore how FIU and GCU have committed to change making and what kind of impact that has had for them over the last few years. Um, and then really kind of as we're exploring this momentum and this interest towards university commitment to impact and the idea of civic engagement, um, then the emergence of the impact rankings and kind of learn more from Times Higher Education as to the what, the why, and the how of that, um, and maybe the future trajectory for it. Um, and then hopefully we'll dig into some more kind of the operational details of, um, you know, how do you engage uh, with the board on this topic? How do you engage with the faculty on this topic? How do you make and prioritize what you're measuring? Um, so we'll try to draw on a few examples from our panelists, but then really kind of use that as a, a launch pad for your conversations and for more discovery across your institutional context. So with that, I'd love to turn to our panelists. Um, and so uh, Duncan, Emily, and, and Cam, if you would, you've already kind of introduced your name and your role, so you may not need to repeat that. But maybe just as we kind of warm up and get started, maybe share how you're personally interested in and connected to this topic. Why does this topic resonate with you and or why is it a part of your function and your job? Um, help us understand how you are related to or positioned to this topic. So I might start with um, Emily. Do you mind if I could start with you? Sure. Um, so I've been involved with Ashoka, I want to say five years now. It could be six, but I think it's five. Um, and personally, it relates to me just upbringing, right? So immigrant household, grew up in New York. And at one point, we went completely bankrupt, right? And so we became homeless. And so when, when you're like 17 and you're suddenly homeless, it's kind of an odd place to be in and there could be despair or there could be social safety nets and luckily for me it was new york city where you can get anywhere for a monthly metro card at the time this was in 2000 so at the time it was only 63 dollars. i don't know what it is now um and you know we had a, a public um university that i could go to at night when i worked all day and so you know worked three jobs went to school at night 63 bucks for a metro card and to me, it really showed what, I think it really um, helped me understand that sometimes people just need a little bit of help to get them through. And I think that's always resonated with me ever since. Amazing, thank you, Emily. A huge champion of change making on your campus and interacting with students. Love to, great to hear more about your lived experience as well. Um, Cam, may I turn to you next? Yeah, thanks. I mean, as well as my current position or positions, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a health economist. That's, that's been my kind of academic discipline for 35 years now. And I, I, I've I always just thought of, of economics as a, as a social science. Um, in terms of institutional experience, I, I suppose I sort of worked my way through different, what you might call more elite universities in the UK before I went off to work in in Canada for, for five years. I'm a Canadian citizen uh, as, as well as being Scottish. And um, there I kind of observed their more elite universities being, and I think it's probably the same to varying degrees in, in, in the USA as well. They, they were really quite well connected with their local communities. To me, in a way that uh, UK universities uh, were not. And, and, and I found that same kind of experience when I when I returned to uh, to the UK, um, and so that that's what then attracted me to 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 work with uh, Glasgow Caledonian University. I came here back to my hometown as well, incidentally, in Glasgow in in 2010 to establish the uh, the, the the Unis Centre for Social Business and Health. And to me. This seemed like a, a university that was really striving to connect with its community, you know, the local community, but the, just the idea of community. So it could expand that, uh, obviously, uh, internationally. So I, I, I was I was particularly attracted with uh, with the idea of trying to build a research agenda 
uh, around that. So that 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 was really what took me to uh, to to the current uh, position that that I'm in at the moment. Wonderful. Thanks, Cam. It's a great teaser for unpacking a little bit of that story here in a second, um, especially around the research center. Um, and Duncan, other than the obvious, the fact that you work for a ranking um, institution, maybe share with us how this resonates with you. Yeah, so um, I grew up, you won't be able to tell this, uh, particularly those of you from the UK, but I grew up in the northeast of England um, in a place overlooking a town called Consett. And for those of you in the UK, that may mean something if you grew up in the uh, early part of the Thatcherite um, the Thatcher years. But I've always had um, a really close resonance with the, with the concept of community. And I am, I think it's fair to say, a serial volunteer and probably an addict in terms of vol volunteerism. That you know that any of one of you who's a volunteer, you know how it starts. You start off helping out for half an hour a month. You wake up two days later and suddenly your entire life's been taken over by this. Uh, I was chair of trustees of a large um, British children's charity for, for several years. Um, and then as my career grew into the world of data, I was one of the founder members of an organization called DataKind UK. And DataKind's job really is to provide pro, pro bono data scientists to other charities to really help organizations understand how they can use data for good. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, the original data kind in the US out of New York, um, and we also have branches in Bangalore and in Singapore um, and in DC as well, and I think in San Francisco. But it's, uh, that's the heart of who I am. I love doing things with data. I love the things that it can do if you use it carefully, and I'm scared to death of the things it can do very badly if you use it badly. Um, and so I've always had this social good element of, of what I've been doing, and Working at Times Higher Education, most of our focus was around research, uh, research for intensive universities. And as I'll say later on, I don't want to jump ahead too much. Suddenly there came this opportunity to think about the social good and the social impact that universities are having. And so I leapt at that. Amazing. All right. Another trailer for what's to come. Um, with that, I'd love to dig into some of the, the things that you've already started to mention. And so maybe Cam, I'll start with you, if that's okay. Um, uh, we know that, that you, you've mentioned it, uh, Glasgow Caledonian is committed to the common good and that that's traditionally been a part of your seal, that's been a part of the ethos of the institution. And yet I know a large part of that story is kind of a doubled down commitment by the, the principal in the last few years and a, an investment in the UNIS Research Center that you've kind of spoken to. Could you kind of unpack a little bit more for us that story, kind of why is GCU committed to change making and social innovation? And kind of what in broad strokes, what kind of impact has that had before we kind of dive into the mechanics? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try. I mean, it's, I mean, there are two, two big reasons. One is leadership and the other is that people have, people have bought into it. That, I mean, that for the common good, uh, historically, at least in the UK, I think it goes back to the great and the good of Victorian society, thinking about how they could give back. And I mention that because that, that, that the, the, the common wheel uh, society is really what partly underpinned the funding of our original nursing college in 1875. And uh, as you say, therefore, for the common wheel or for the common good was in our in the seal of that institution and was carried over uh, into our current seal when we became a fully fledged university in 1993. But I would say in terms of leadership, the, that, uh, that, that never came alive for us as, as a, an institutional direction in terms of making it our mission uh, in the modern context until uh, our, the arrival of our principal vice chancellor, what some, some would call uh, president. Uh, Pamela Gillies in 2006. So she's the one that I think made it our mission in the modern context. And, and, and it's, it's actually in one, it's actually quite handy, really. We, we don't really need to sit down and think and by committee and think about what's our mission. It's already there. And then we can begin to work on what stems from that. So now it's about in the modern context. I think it's about innovating for social purpose, not for profit. It, around the campus, it might have other characteristics like by communities, for communities, reinvesting surplus into whatever uh, the mission is. Uh, but there's a range that also goes through to you know, smaller to larger social enterprises or, or B Corps, as, as some people might, might think of them. 
but also even big business uh, getting uh, involved as well. In a sense, we have to be quite flexible about that. And, but I, I think, I suppose what I'm getting at is, is that looking between the leadership and the staff, building an agenda around that mission, I think does require working at all sorts of different levels of the university. So there's a, Pamela Gillies is our, the sense our chief executive, but our chancellor, our kind of honorary head who was appointed under her tenure was, uh, was in 2012 was Mohammed Yunus, Nobel Peace Laureate. Uh, and I, I think that, that that just made a huge statement about what we were about as a, as a university internationally. He's been succeeded by Annie Lennox, not because she's an amazing uh, singer-songwriter, but because of her uh, humanitarian work. So you the, 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 these appointments are really important in terms of uh, messages in the institution. We've changed some parts of the institution. We've reorientated others. So our our business school is actually the Glasgow School for Business and Society, but there's things that come with that. Um, we have a, a really strong school of health and life sciences. Uh, and then we try to embed it within those entities throughout, in the curriculum, in research, but also in institutional operations. So uh, to take a, a whole institution approach. Ashoka U, Prime, are not just badges of accreditation, but they are important to us because they, they're, a, they're a test of our commitment. We know what you guys put us through when we're actually going for that accreditation. Uh, and it, it really is a test of the, of the institution. I think you also have to have flagships. Uh, that's where the UNIS Centre comes in, which was where I started at Glasgow Caledonian, uh, which is the UNIS Centre. We just celebrated our 10th. Uh, anniversary and we were able in that centre to build a, a research agenda around the ideas of Muhammad Yunus and the common good but how they would apply in more sort of western in our case uh, Scottish uh, context but the university had to invest in that so the, those flagships are important but you have to invest in them. Working with Professor Yunus and going around the world with him from time to time you you often see how the aim of some universities is maybe just to get somebody like UNIS onto campus for an event and then nothing really happens after that or a small group of people are left in their, uh, in this case, UNIS centre, but the, the university doesn't really uh, invest in it. And I think that's, that's the key thing is investing through not only the research in my case, but through the curriculum and, as I say, in the, the wider operational aspects of the university. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Cam. And I do, part of the story that has um, intrigued me so much is that that significant investment, not just in those board relationships and positions, but also in the research center and the university backing and, and kind of taking a stand in that. Um, can, you, can you say from those kind of commitments, um, what kind of yield have you seen this have for the university? What dividends is this paying in terms of of revenue or research funds or student attraction, like what is the impact um, that this commitment has been has materialized into? Yeah, I mean, in Scotland, talking about student impact, I, maybe Val's better place to uh, to talk about this than, than myself. But I, we've had a we've got an organisation in Scotland called the Social Enterprise Academy, and they've got a really quite a large, comprehensive program in schools around educating children with respect to social enterprise so asking them questions like you know what are the problems of the world what should we do about it and out of that pops ideas for for social enterprises funnily enough and the, those cohorts are now beginning to come through into into our universities and asking us questions about well you know what, what's here for me in this respect and so we have, and partly through our association with Ashoka U, we, we have innovated, I think, throughout the, our curricula and, and continue to do so uh, to ensure that those interests are, are not only catered for, but in some, as some parts of the university, they're, they're driving um, what we do. Research-wise, well, that, that, that's a really interesting one. I think, I think the key thing there is patience um, because we, like, 
it's a bit difficult to explain, but our, our, the title of our UNIS Centre is UNIS Centre for Social Business and Health. So the idea there was to try and go through notions of social business, social enterprise, basically entities that are more than about the enterprise itself, but they're about enhancing social connectivity uh, in, in communities and thinking about that as a social determinant of health to, to, to try and get at some of the enduring so, uh, inequalities in health that still exist, particularly, particularly in, in Scotland, but particularly in, in the west of Scotland where we are situated. Now, for some research funders, that was quite a, a strange concept. So it took us a few years to actually hit the jackpot with our major funders like the Medical Research Council, which has, I suppose in US terms is a bit like equivalent to NIH. Uh, but we did it. But I do remember going into Pamela Gillis's office after about three years and saying to her, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure this is working. Uh, and, and she she just told me to just hang on, it will come good. And about six months later, we hit the jackpot with that grant that I just referred to with the Medical Research Council, but also a large European grant as the funders themselves began to see the kind of things we were we were we were talking about, where social enterprises that are, don't even mention health in their mission could still impact on people's health and, and well-being. That was the that was a message that we were struggling to get across uh, but eventually we managed to to, to build uh, the center around wonderful thank you so much cam and i think i'd love to um to kind of put a pin in and come back to a couple of the themes that you articulated especially around board engagement um, around the impact on research and uh, likely probably attracting research talent around that as well. So we'll put a pin in that and come back to it here in a little bit. I'd love to invite Emily into the conversation as well and appreciate there's some similarities with uh, Florida International University with regard to, uh, you know, applied research and research that makes an impact in the world as well as community engagement. But your contexts are very, very different and your institutional sizes and locations are very different. Tell us a little bit about Kind of the change maker journey for for um, Florida International, and maybe kind of how you're situated within your state, and kind of the, the the landscape, and therefore why and how change making makes a difference for you guys. Yeah, so um, the change maker sort of journey for us was an odd one because in the very beginning, people just they didn't really understand that this was um, a thing you can go get, like why was a designation but not that why was it a thing but that it was a thing because for them they had been doing it forever right so fiu is about 50 years old we were born out of this notion that just because you couldn't afford a, a quality education didn't mean you didn't get one and we had to fight for seven years to from from time of charter to when we can open our doors because of the sort of political um uh, weight of, of other institutions. So we're a state university and within Florida, there are 12 others, um, there are 12 of us in, in total. So we're actually the only um, university within the state system uh, that, that's a designated Ashoka U Changemaker campus. We're, you know, obviously happy to share uh, the designation with uh, Rollins and with, with Miami Dade College. So I always feel like, like, um, in fact, it's funny, our vice president for research, our, his daughter just started at Rollins. And, and one of the things, going back to what um, Trustee Lord was saying, it, it, she, she was very attracted to the, the, the change maker sort of um, ethos that, that Rollins as well. And um, what we saw was the enthusiasm just across the board from our faculty to our students, um, on what change making really means. We've always been sort of the upstart, but when President Rosenberg took over as president in 2009, similar to um, Dr. Gillis, right? She, she, he wanted us to be community focused. He wanted us to be about our backyard as well. And so he created the engagement office where everyone sort of um, had more conversations about how FIU could be 
um, a partner, how our research um, agenda can actually be reflective of the university. I mean, I'm sorry, the community we live in. And also, you know, we're a minority majority university. So 80% of our 58,000 students are minority. And for me, what's valuable about that is we have now people of color in research labs, writing scholarships, teaching, and now we get to bring out perspectives that aren't always represented in academia. And I think that's what makes it really powerful for us. I, I know that when we've talked about this before, Emily, you also kind of spoke to kind of what students are looking for. And I'd love for you to kind of tease that out a little bit. What are your observations there? Yeah, so students are looking for agency. And, you know, this Generation Z and their sense of purpose is it's uplifting at the same time scary. Like you want to just try to meet their expectations. You know, they're so darn hopeful. Um, and, and so I think for us, um, I remember w working with a student who said the reason why she turned down um, going to a much better ranked school um, was because she emailed three professors um, from these three different colleges and FIU's professor was the only one that returned her email saying, well, I think you kind of have a good idea. Let's think about this, this, and this. And for us, it's all about how do we activate our students? How do they become co-creators with us? How do we give them that voice, knowing that there's a lot of them and not that many of us? Um, I think that that has been incredible to see because in the five years that we've been doing this, you know, we went from an enrollment of 54,000 students to now we're a little over 58,000 and where enrollment across the universities have kind of gone down, even during uh, COVID-19, ours has gone up. So in the summer, it's gone up. Now I'm not saying it's because of change making alone. I'm just saying it must be more than a coincidence. Um, but you know, our summer, our students were, uh, we had the, the, the biggest summer enrollment uh, in history this past summer. And our, our enrollment numbers for the fall have been up by a thousand. And there's a lot of change maker type initiatives that are just happening across campus that we don't even know about half the time. Awesome. Thank you, Emily, for sharing. And, and Duncan, um, I would imagine these stories resonate with you and are just kind of two examples of many that you're seeing through the rankings. Love to hear a little bit about, you've alluded to it already, but kind of the genesis of the impact rankings. Um, you guys have been ranking organizations or in institutions rather for a couple decades. So why the impact rankings and why now? Tell us a little bit about that. I had to fall for that again. So yes, we started off um, back in 2004 um, when we were still owned by Rupert Murdoch, um, looking at universities. And we'd, we'd been um, looking at universities from an editorial perspective for years, but we started to think about how we could measure things more discreetly. And so we started the World University Rankings. And those are unashamedly research-focused and research-led. Um, and most of the international rankings are. And just in terms of a question that Marina raised on the chat there, that has a huge implication because when you look at research, pretty much everything you measure tends to be biased. No matter how carefully you try and normalize it, it tends to be biased towards science and medicine because they publish more, they receive more citations. Um, it's very difficult and they receive bigger grants. I mean, that's another crucial element of it. Is, uh, you ever, ever talk to an art historian about the difficulty of raising money? Um, so clearly that, although it's trying to do, and I hope it is doing a reasonable job, tends to be biased towards certain institutions and particularly, let's be clear, Global North institutions, the US, the UK, Western Europe, a scattering of Australian universities get in there to make it look international. And when you think about the, the mission of universities, actually, research isn't the only thing that universities are there to do. There are other things that are equally, some would say even more important. Teaching is one of those, but also impact. And one of the things that, that I hope will come out of, of the work we're doing around impact, and I know it's not perfect by any means, 
but we are seeing that universities that aren't the traditional great and good are able to outperform where they would come in other rankings when we look at the impact they're doing. So really, how did we get here? Well, we've been doing this work on research universities. Uh, we started to explore impact about three years ago, three and a half years ago. Actually, it was at our, I think, our, our young university summit at the South Florida University. Um, so not a million miles away from Florida International. And there we started to breach this idea of could we look at impact? And if we were going to look at impact, what did we mean by that? And I took a very lazy decision. And I, I strongly believe that many of the best decisions are the laziest decisions. I could have built up my own framework for understanding impact, in which case everyone would be spending all their time beating me up about my framework. Instead, I, I came across, well, I didn't come across, I um, became aware of the sustainable development goals. And that seemed to be the obvious framework which would link together not just the sort of traditional aspects of um, you know, the green university and how do you make your campus as effective as it can be, but also the crucial issues of social inequality um, that we see you know, rife throughout our societies. And, and you know, again, touching on uh, the statement you made right at the beginning, Angie, when you talked about reflecting on um, the impact on particularly First Nations. Well, in, in the UK, we don't have any direct First Nations. We wiped those out about 3,000 years ago. But we do have a huge impact on the peoples and the countries we interacted with. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that this is something that actually can put some of what the work that universities are doing in context and in a much broader context as well. So sorry for rambling there a little bit, but... Uh... Oh, that's great. Thanks. I was struggling to find my mute button as well. It's a Zoom casualty for all of us. <laughs> um, and maybe just give us a little bit of an overview before we kind of compare like what you're learning from the process, just for those who may not be as familiar, briefly, the kind of high level methodology for it. So for those of you who know, uh, know me, um, so Brendan, I can spend an hour on this. I'm now going to try and do it in two minutes, which is going to be a bit of a stretch. So what we decided to do was we were going to produce a ranking for each of the 17 SDGs because we didn't think it made sense to impose our own overlay on top of that. If we did that, we would be imposing yet another um, kind of structure on the SDGs and saying that one particular SDG was more or less important than others. So we have rankings for each of the 17, but we also have an overall ranking that is created from SDG 17, Partnership for the Goals, because we think that speaks, to, that's a sort of meta SDG and speaks to interactions, plus any three others. Why only three? Well, firstly, for those of you who've, who've looked at the, uh, what we're trying to gather here, we're asking universities to put a huge amount of work into this. And if we asked you to provide data for all 17 SDGs, to be honest, what we would be saying is, do you have a strong institutional research department that can collect the data? In other words, are you a Global North University? So it would almost be a self-fulfilling problem there. We also hoped that by allowing universities to choose at a, a minimum one plus three, that they would actually demonstrate that they were focusing on the issues that mattered most to them. Why would a university in uh, Miami have the same focus as a university in Malaysia or a university in, um, uh, I tried to think of somewhere in Russia, uh, Moscow. Uh, let's, no, let's go for somewhere more interesting, Novosibirsk. Obviously, universities should be flexing to fit the local needs. And it was one of the brilliant things that came through about the, both the story of Florida International, but also the, uh, the story of Glasgow Caledonian. It's that aspect of saying what's important to our communities. And that is really, really crucial. So that's the way we build it up. But those of you who've read all the SDG documentation, and there is an awful lot of it, will know that the SDGs aren't written for universities. So we also had to build out a theory of change which took the SDGs and tried to interpret what they were aiming for through the prism of higher education. And so we built out a lightweight theory of change. It has four elements. So the first way that universities could clearly be working towards the SDGs is through research. You do brilliant research around health, then that clearly impacts SDG 3. The second aspect is through stewardship. So how you look after the resources that you are stewards of, not just the physical resources, but also people. And this is something we often forget. You know, universities are significant employers. 
how you treat your employees, both directly employed and indirectly employed, is really important, particularly as we see happening now in, in the crisis that we're seeing through COVID. And also your students as well, you know, how you look after your students. The third aspect is outreach, what universities are directly doing in their communities, however that is defined. And I think this is a really, really important point because higher education is under threat. And one of the key things we're seeing universities doing to address that is to try and re-engage with their community, however they define that, whether that's their city, whether that's their state, whether that's even in the international community. But that connection that of direct action in the community is really, really important in grounding universities. And then the fourth and final element is around teaching, both about how you are providing people with the necessary skills for specific SDGs, so for example, sustainable agriculture, but also more generally, how are you teaching so that your alumni go out into whatever career path they choose and take with them that uh, knowledge base, that understanding of what it means to be a sustainable citizen and hopefully a change maker in their future roles. Wonderful. Thanks, Duncan. And I'm curious what you have observed in, I guess, now it's two rounds. Is that correct? What you've observed in the kind of first two rounds? Any trends or emergent themes that you're kind of seeing? So, as I say, the first the first interesting thing was I had put out this theory that maybe um, universities would focus on what was important to them locally. Now, my null hypothesis would have been that universities just submitted to uh, SDGs fairly randomly and I got an even distribution. But we did see that. We saw that universities were genuinely focusing on the issues that made most, had most resonance where they were. So for example, universities from India were significantly more likely to submit data around SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, than universities in Europe. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, well, European universities, by the way, almost always chose SDG 16, peace, justice and strong institutions, and SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, because that is basically the heart of the Treaty of Rome. That's the European Union in a nutshell. And I should apologize for Brexit at this stage. Um, uh, interestingly, universities in America were, were far less likely to submit data around SDG 16 and SDG 8, but I'm not going to make any comment on that at the moment. Um, so we saw that. We also saw a number of universities who were saying, well, actually, it turns out that we've been doing a huge amount of work towards sustainability already. We just weren't aware of it, either because their structure was very diverse. So sustainability for many universities hasn't been something that has necessarily come through the president or the VC's office. It's been either a separate group or even sometimes just individuals working on it. And so pulling this together has been a really useful uh, exercise we hope for many universities as a way of consolidating and understanding the great things that they are already doing because universities are huge organizations often they don't know what they're doing themselves thanks so much duncan and i um i think that i'd love to dive into that with also with emily and cam here in a second in terms of just kind of like the pragmatics of of gathering this data aligning this data and what that does internally before doing so, I was really struck by Marina's comment in the chat, and I'd be curious, you know, um, this question around language and the degree to which, what kind of language, and, and this was prompted by Crane even before that in the chat, what kind of language was resonating, and why do you think institutions are being drawn? I, if I remember correctly, your participation was about 80% higher the second year, that you had a, a big jump in participation. Love to, to hear about the narratives or the, the incentives and motivations that people are, are following. So the, the first year we were, um, I, I, I've told this story a number of times, so apologies if you've heard it. So uh, when you're putting together a ranking, 100 is a good number to have as a minimum. If you have much less than 100, it's not a ranking, it's an editorial list. Okay, uh, and you will see this from time to time. And we had no idea how many universities were going to participate. I'd also say that universities behave in many ways very like undergraduate students in that you set them a deadline and they see this as more of a target than an or even an aspiration than perhaps a, a something they should uh, get in a long time before. So in the final week of data collection on the Tuesday, we had about 30 universities and I was thinking it's editorial list time. By the Thursday, we had about 130 universities, and by the Friday, we had uh, 580 universities, I think, in total participated. So, uh, but we understand why, you know, as a university, bearing your soul like that 
at some, for something that was completely untested, there wasn't anything equivalent out there. You have no idea whether you're going to come out looking brilliant or you're going to come out looking like you know, the biggest bunch of idiots uh, that ever existed. That's a big reputational risk. So we were delighted that so many universities chose to participate. And what we are seeing is that more universities are starting to use this. Yes, the, the visibility is good and it's important. But actually, more importantly, to use this as putting a stake in the ground and saying, actually, this is a demonstration, a pu very public demonstration of our commitment, even to areas where we think we might not be doing that well. But actually saying that we want to participate, saying that we're going to do this or indeed, actually, you know, let's be clear here. I'd love all the universities on this call to, to submit data for this year. That opens on the 1st of October. If you don't have a link, do, p uh, do email me. But to be honest, I don't really care that much whether they do it through our system or they go to the US STARS system or they um, find another system of their own to do it. The thing that's more important is that universities actually are clear about the work that they're doing towards sustainability. Thanks, Duncan. I really appreciate that kind of uh, laser focus on what is the mission and fulfilling one's mission in local context um, and, and finding um, mechanisms to continue to align internally as well to be able to kind of articulate that stake in the ground that the institution is making. Um, I'd love to turn back to, to Cam and Emily now and kind of you both gave kind of evidence in your stories of FIU and, and, and Glasgow Caledonian of really put a stake in the ground and saying this is what our institution is about and this is kind of how we're going to, to live and breathe and operate. Love for you to kind of just comment now kind of on the heels of, of Duncan's comments about the, the impact rankings. I believe that both of your institutions have engaged in that ranking and and probably at great cost, as Duncan said, any of these kind of uh, data gathering methods take time and prioritization. So curious about why your institutions kind of were engaged in, in that. Um, and then I'd love after that we'll drill into the mechanics of some of the, the challenges operationally of, of aligning measurement. So either one, whoever would like to go. I'm happy oh, to. No, go on, um, go, go on. ahead, Cam. No, no. <laughs> We're so polite, go. aren't we? Or um, you could argue that we participated because Pamela Gillies told us to our, our principal. <laughs> um, but we we had already embarked on. You know, we had the common good. We had the common good. We had, we had our um, strategy 2020, which we launched in 2014, was all based around the common good. In, in 2017, we became, I think, the first university to use the SDGs as the, as the guiding framework for its research strategy. Um, we've always done well in terms of um, the, the greenness of our campus and different um, indicators and competitions with in, in that respect. So a lot of the impact rankings in a sense seem to uh, be made for us. I think that that was why, uh, I was joking apart, that was why Pamela Gillies thought that uh, we, we should be uh, in there with this. Having said that, I, I do think that we, uh, well, the small group that were tasked with um, putting our, our, or at least leading our bid and collating the information, I think we're, we were worried, you know, because we thought, well, we, we, we all, well, I suppose all rankings like that are, are, are by their nature are retrospective. And so this was collecting data from the recent past vis-a-vis -vis the SDGs and we were worried that actually we, we, we were, we were as an institution, uh, led by the common good, we, 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 had, we were using the SDGs as our guiding framework, our, a prospective strategic uh, um, framework looking, looking to the future. So we thought um, we would um, be penalised as, as a result of that in, in, in these rankings, because one, one weakness of all rankings is, uh, is basically what they're made up of. Uh, and they, they include important things, but they also could miss other important things. Nevertheless, we went for it and uh, we did well. We came out in the top 50 uh, globally and for an institution like ours, as Duncan was uh, alluding, we, that was big to, to come 
in the top 50 in any international ranking for an institution like ours uh, was is, is is really big so then success begets success we think we'll go in second year thinking again pessimistically oh no here come the big folks uh, that, that are coming in uh, to, to the rankings again uh, we, we we did work on you know we had a little group working on different ways in which we could improve uh, and um, but still we're quite pessimistic about how we would how we would do but still very much in there uh, because as an institution we we believe in the SDGs and, and how they relate to to the common good anyway um, and in some senses that relates to your question about the cost of collecting this information if we if we want to portray ourselves in this respect then we're having to do a lot of this work uh, anyway, of course, you have to look at the details of the rankings and how you tweak that collation and information collection to do the best that you do in the rankings. And then again, we came out in the top 50 uh, in the second year as well. And in some senses, we were even more astonished uh, at, at, uh, at that result uh, than, than we were uh, uh, the first time around. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're now continuing. We now have a an SDG integration working group where we're continuing to, uh, to, 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 to look continuously now at ways in which we just will further and further embed the SDGs through our institution. So it's, it sounds really similar to, um, uh, I just got a visual metaphor of kind of a virtuous cycle, uh, Cam, and that's, we actually did a, a panel at uh, the exchange, which Craig, our colleague who just had to depart, um, was the moderator of that, you know, the institution puts a stake in the ground and says, this is what we're about and we're going after. And then there's sure. a ranking that actually provides kind of like a positive feedback loop that kind of incentivizes you to kind of in even further ingrain it in the institutional culture and measurement and alignment, um, which, uh, which I think can be really important. Emily. Yeah, I think, I think they reinforce each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Emily, what, what, why has this been important to FIU and, um, and maybe even start to lead us into some of the mechanics? I know that you and I were chatting about kind of engagement with board and faculty. So, so walk us through some of those and then we'll uh, ask Cam and Duncan to kind of snowball their, their uh, comments and feedback in it too. Sure, and um, very much like um, um, Glasgow Caledonian, we our provost said to do it, right? So, so our provost said, and the funny thing is, you know, our president, he's like this warm, you know, just um, amazing leaps off the the page kind of personality, right? And he's all like community, community, community. And the provost, it's funny, he's. He's got this thing where I looked at his strength finders one time and competition was like his number fourth strength. He's so competitive. And so for him, right, he was like, oh, a new ranking that we can potentially like do well in, let's try. And so I, I actually didn't even know about it the first year. It wasn't until, you know, the rankings came out this year um, that we ranked, uh, I think it was nine in life uh, below water. And what was what kind of going back to Duncan's point, that's our backyard. Marine is our backyard, right? We have fresh water, we have ocean. So um, so we've been doing that for a long time and, and we did really well. And you know, going to Cam's point, we don't rank nine in a lot of things. Like I'm just saying, you know, so so we're kind of like, this is so exciting. So and and we did well on other ones, like no poverty, right? So it was like, yeah. And for me, when I found that out, I was like, oh, you people are finally listening to the SDGs because I've only been talking about it for five years. But yay, I'm so glad now that you validated its existence. Um, so, so we use sort of that momentum to, to our change making strategy. So there's two things we did to sort of build the infrastructure around it. First, you're absolutely right. We need to Universities have to have enough resources to have an institutional research office with really, really awesome data scientists that can put this stuff together. And luckily we have this whiz kid who just lived day and night to just build out this whole portal that's just the SDGs. And he broke down every single SDG and the things that we can do. But what I loved about what he did was he embedded a link there because he said, there's no way he can collect enough data. So I want, you know, so let's open it up so that anyone can upload 
sort of their evidence as to what they're doing. And what I liked about that was that democratizes, right? The, the, the sort of um, giving people um, so, sort of a light to shine on what they're doing. Um, and so that was one piece of it was he was building that up this summer. And when I got wind of that, I inserted myself and Imani, our director of social innovation, and we started meeting with them weekly because what we want to do is once we know what the framework is, we're going to go ahead and meet with every faculty member that we can, every student that we can, because for us, what matters is less about the rankings, don't tell the provost, but it's a lot more about how we believe that these are the problems of our time. This is the existential challenges that all of us need to be working toward. And for us as a minority majority university, I want people of color to be working on these problems and taking care of it from their, or, or, or addressing it from their perspective. And so it was like a godsend to have these rankings come. I'm not even saying that just because Duncan's on the call, because I didn't know it was a thing until, and I didn't know Duncan until today. So I'm just saying it works in terms of your positive unintended consequence is that we are using it to embed it into our own change-making agenda. Now, if I can just pick up on something from that, which I think is quite unusual in terms of the ranking space. So um, most rankings, and indeed part of this one, is based around numbers. So we ask you how many students you have, uh, how much water you use, and so on. Um, and that's actually quite difficult to democratize because it's simply a number, you know, uh, there's no point in asking every single member of your faculty how many students are there because crowdsourcing that doesn't work. <laughs> but in this particular ranking, we're also asking for evidence of things that you're doing. So we say, for example, what work are you doing uh, to cooperate with local authorities or national or regional authorities around water security? And that requires you to find a piece of evidence. Now, sometimes if your university is particularly well organized, your president might just be able to tap into your internet and, and you know search an outlook and find it more often that will be somewhere in a department someone will be working on that maybe someone in the social um uh, social sciences for example is working on that or even in economics gathering that data together together is requires a, a kind of non-traditional data um setup it's not the kind of thing that you often see in rankings and so it can be used in that way of actually pulling that data together across the university and Kim, I would, I would venture a guess that even the alignment, even before the rankings, the alignment of the SDD, the research agenda to the SDGs has been a powerful tool for you, probably in communicating with and drawing in faculty. Love any other kind of observations or, or reflections that you have from Glasgow Caledonian from an internal alignment perspective or engagement perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think when we first, or a small group of us first thought about it, I mean, it seemed to us obvious, you know, common good. At that time, Eunice was our chancellor. He was an SDG uh, ambassador. Uh, and I, I looked at the SDGs and I thought, you know, this, 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 this describes about 80, 90% of, of, of the research that we're doing. That, that, that this, is, this is amazing, but still, some people w would look at you kind of askance when you, you, you talked about the SDGs. So some people thought they still applied only to uh, lower and middle income countries. So if their research wasn't international in that respect, it didn't apply to them. I, I still find it amazing today that some people, not that I don't mean people at GCU, but uh, some people at, at higher education institutions still, uh, still think that and aren't aware that they apply to all countries uh, of the world. So it, 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 the, the idea just began to take off as we took it around the university and began to talk to people. And I think they began to see how, wow, you know, my research actually, this little bit of research over here actually contributes to this huge, uh, probably the greatest, most comprehensive statement of global needs that's ever, ever been issued. And in, in a sense, it began to build up, I think, people's confidence uh, mm. around around the, the, the institution. And again, I, I, I don't know if maybe Val can comment, given her portfolio of, of teaching and learning, but I, I do sometimes wonder if, if pulling together the researchers around that agenda and within that framework 
you know, began then to uh, seep out across the, uh, the 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 rest of the institution. And in, in a way, now we're we're thinking now about strategy 2030, where the whole institution strategy is going to be framed uh, around uh, addressing or having the SDGs as the uh, as the guiding framework. But it it just begins to seep out, and you know, it, it you know, in the way just just described as well. Yeah. I really appreciate that and as I kind of draw out a couple of themes that started at the top of the panel and then come here as well is not only as uh, you know doing impact the right thing right and commit the university committing to the address the local problems in its community but also that it can be useful in both positioning the university for external accreditations or designations or rankings that we're seeing an increasing trend towards that the impact ranking being one of other kind of indicators of that trend. But then that also can kind of serve as a positive reinforcement loop that really helps motivate and align um, the uh, commitment to one strategy, the execution against that strategy, and kind of reinforcing that as a practice and a behavior, as well as a focused measurement technique. Um, I also really appreciated uh, the, the discussion that we, we started um, and haven't had a chance to unpack too much now, but I'd invite that further in the breakouts, which we're going to move to here shortly, around kind of board engagement. And so, Cam, you offered some examples of how that's been both probably uh, an important signal um, externally to, to folks about what the institution cares about, but also probably an incredible enabler and lever for catalyzing even further commitments within the institution. I know, Emily, you've shared a couple of examples as well of engaging with your board around this topic um, and kind of getting them just to appreciate the value of different kind of rankings and different metrics. 